Welcome to Discovering. Well, the ice fishing gear is tucked away and the camo is back out of the closet. It's turkey time. Glad to say that my brother can call in a nice big town for me for the first time. We'll get a lesson in tree grafting and we'll take a look at some furs ready for market. That's all tonight, so sit back and relax. It's Monday night and time for Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. The call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure, the only way I measure feelings that I have for this fine land. There is so much to discover when you're a longtime lover of northern Michigan. For some, turkey hunting is a solo experience. For others, it's about getting together with friends and hitting the woods to do what we love to do, hunt. For brothers Cody and Ryan Whitens, along with friend Tyler Bray, that's exactly what opening morning of turkey season was all about. So this morning, uh, Ryan got his bird and this is his first tom of his career. Um, we're starting him off right here, it's a beautiful bird. Um, last year he did shoot a Jake for his first turkey and then um, this year, I'm happy to call it in for him, and it's a beautiful bird, so. We had a few encounters at a few other spots of ours. Uh, we actually called a Tom and two Jakes off the roost, came in, put on a show for us, but um, unfortunately, we missed them. But that happens hunting, not killing. The Tom we harvested this morning, um, it's a very beautiful spur on it. It has at least an inch, I'm gonna say an inch and a quarter for sure, pretty close there. But the thing about this bird, it, it doesn't have another spur. It looks like it busted off probably a few years back. So it's a one spur tom, but <laughs> the beard on it's at least nine inches. It's a beautiful bird. And when we saw him coming in strutting, and um, it's just a beautiful, beautiful sight, beautiful morning. So this bird here is, we went to one of our spots and uh, what I did initially was just give out some yelps. Usually when a hen yelps, it's just basically asking who's in the general area. So that's how I kind of started off that hunt. Basically what that's saying is, is there any other turkeys in the area? Um, after I did that call, we started getting some cuts and some cackles from other hens in the area. But I was messing with them a little bit, and then we heard him gobble. And that's when I knew he was henned up with a few hens. So uh, what we did, we swooped around and we positioned ourselves on the edge of the field here. And um, I just started calling. I wasn't calling to him, but I was calling to the hens. And that happens a lot of times um, early in the year here when a lot of these birds are locked down with other hens. Um, they're not interested in coming to your hen because um, he's already satisfied. So what I did was I started cutting to these hens and uh, 
got them aggravated and they came in. Came into 10 yards and he he's smart. Um, but what I did was I was cutting at the hens and they came in because they're very territorial. So. And those hens didn't like it. Um, he kind of held back, but once they pushed onto the decoy, he started coming in. Uh, I was messing around with some trees. <laughs> I had some trees between me and Ryan here, but we made it work and we got it on film. So. After shooting at Jake last year, my brother and uh, good friend and cousin here, Tyler Bray, got me into uh, turkey hunting big time. I like it just as much as uh, rifle hunting for deer, but um, glad to say that my brother could call in a nice big tom for me for the first time. at least a three and a half year old bird. He's got a very nice beard. And if you look at this tom here, you can notice that the wings here, they're all nipped off. Um, that's because he's been strutting most of his life. <laughs> you can tell he's one of the dominant birds in the area. So it's always nice to harvest a mature animal, especially turkeys. I'm just ready to put them on the grill now. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> A while back, we were at Pleasant View Orchard for some lessons on pruning apple trees. Here's a look at grafting. Most years, I like to do some grafting. I'll buy, you have to buy the rootstocks. Again, the rootstock, you, you want the tree to, uh, to grow on, the characteristics that you want. You try growing a Cortland tree from a seed from a Cortland apple, you will not get a Cortland apple. Apple trees have to cross-pollinate, and you'll get a mix of genetics, and you'll get something entirely different. If you want a Cortland tree, you have to basically clone the tree, and you do that by cutting off a branch on the Cortland tree. And what you want is uh, last year's growth. Now, this happens to be last year's growth, a pretty strong growth, and you can always tell where the growth started First of all, there's a little difference in color. It's going to be a little darker, last year's growth. Then there'll be a little bit of a ring around the branch where last year's growing started. So you cut that off. These are all uh, buds that are possible for grafting. I like a decent size thickness because, as you'll see, uh, the rootstocks come on generally a, a thicker stem than this, but it's hard to find a diameter bigger than this. So you work with what you got. Uh, you want a branch, like say last year's growth, and it should have good sun exposure so that the buds are nice and strong. Okay, what I've got here is uh, some grafting wax that I'm heating up, of course, in a solid form. And I have to get it melted so that I can work with it. Back in uh, early March, I went out and cut some cyan wood these happen to be Zestar, and uh, by the way, the Zestar has a patent on it that hasn't expired yet, so I have to pay a royalty for every tree that that I graft. So, uh, 
when I first started doing this, and I haven't been doing it too many years, that I used the traditional method, which was to take a knife and cut at a slant, cut the cyan wood at a slant. This is the rootstock, got a matching notch or slant on the rootstock, and then notch the cut here, corresponding notch on here, fit them together. Well, the very first uh, tree I tried, I cut my thumb. And I said, "This is, that's enough of that. So what I did is I went out and bought a, a grafting tool. And this really works nice. First thing I'm going to do is find a couple good buds, and there are a lot of them on this branch. You don't want the ones uh, down close to the last year's growth or too close. And you don't want the ones on the end because these, these would be undeveloped buds. You want something in this range. What I do is I pick out a nice fat bud and I cut below that. Got to get it nice and square on there. I guess you call that an omega style cut. I want to leave two or three buds which I hope will sprout. So I cut the branch off above that top bud. Now we've got exposed uh, stem and I gotta, I gotta wax that to keep it from drying out. So I just dip it in my pruning wax, make sure it's covered good, and make a corresponding cut on the rootstock. This happens to be a um, G41 rootstock out of uh, Geneva, New York. Ideally, you want identical diameters. At least 90% of the time they aren't. My little branch, is smaller than the rootstock. Okay, I'm going to make a cut here and I got to make sure I'm going in the right direction that I don't do it upside down. Okay, now I've got a matching cut. Slide the two together. You want the cambium layers to line up. Now, because the sign wood is more narrow than the rootstock, you want a good match on one side. Of course, I don't have, they're not lined up on here. But all you need is to have good contact on one side. Now that looks about as good as I can get. So what I'm going to do now is put grafting wax all the way around. you got to seal it up so that doesn't dry out. Now this is a different technique than what I've used in the past. I always used to use uh, electrician's tape. So I said I'm going to try this technique right here and use graft wax on this as well. And I think it's going to work. Well, time will tell. This is my hundredth one here this spring. And I started a couple of weeks ago, an hour or two at a time. And as soon as you can work the dirt, which is now, I will go out and uh, plant them in my orchard pretty close together so that they're easy to manage. Weeding is a problem, as you can imagine. So, I'll plant them about 12 inches apart and I've got three buds exposed. When they get about that long, I choose the uh, longest one and I leave it on there and I rub off the other two because you only want one stem growing. And so you keep it weeded, keep it watered. And the first year, if you're fortunate, you'll get growth about uh, 10 inches and you got to keep the rabbits away, keep the mice away, however you can do that. And the second year it'll grow a bit more and by the third year you can plant it out in its permanent spot. So it's very simple process. It's kind of fun to do to create your own trees. And it's especially nice if you've got, uh, I've had a number of people say that, uh, you know, uh, there's an apple tree on my grandpa's farm that I remember picking apples there 40 years ago. I'd like to save that tree. Well, this is one way you can do it. Uh, take a cutting, take a cutting during the 
dormant season, get a hold of, get a hold of a, a rootstock, whether you want dwarf, semi-dwarf, whatever, and uh, go ahead and graft. It's kind of fun to do. Most trapping happens in the fall and winter. Taking care of the furs can take place any time of the year. I stopped in for a visit with Bob Whitens, who had a variety of furs ready to head for the auction. Okay, here's a good example of uh, what we usually do as trappers. Nowadays, uh, trapping season starts in October, late October, and we start trapping like muskrats and mink earlier, and then work our way into the coyotes and foxes. But uh, and rather than skin them out and dry them at that particular time, and most trappers do, and myself included, we uh, skin them, roll the pelt up, and uh, put them in a the freezer so that at the appropriate time, usually at the end of the season, we can take them all out at once and uh, spend enough time on them where we can properly get them fleshed out and dried, stretched, and uh, get them ready to ship to the, to the fur auctions. Once you get them up here, you can see the difference in how some of these animals vary in color, like coyotes, for example. You know, you got some with the lighter colors, and you got some that have a little more of a darker tinge to them as you go along there. Actually, what the fur market is looking for is the light color bellies. This is more of a brown here. And you can really see it if you look on the back, so they're more of a darker, darker animal. This particular one right here is a nice, uh, is a nice late, early light color coyote. Where some of these, if I turn them around, you'll see they're pretty, a little bit darker and more brown color to them. You can see that there is quite a bit of variation in coloring. And you can catch them in the same area and some are going to be light, some are going to be dark. Once we get them all dried up like this and get them ready to ship, then we bundle them up and uh, our Trappers uh, Association has a regular pickup. We set them up to the auctions in Canada. And of course at that point they're graded. The buyers are there from all over. A little example of a nice little red fox here. Kind of a cherry red here. They're prime, they have a nice dense fur. And once they're at the auction house, most of these are probably going to end up going to China. And most of the fur dressing is done in China. Then from there, they could go anywhere in Europe where they're made into garments. The garment trade basically uses a lot of the coyote fur for trim. A lot of the high end uh, jackets and coats that are made over in uh, Italy and Germany and Austria, and a lot of people over there wear them. Uh, the rough on the coyote. And the white bellies, they use a lot of that for their trim around the jackets. Same with the fox, they'll use that for most of the trim. You don't see a lot of solid fur coats anymore. Mostly their coats made of a composite of, um, fabric and fur. Bobcat, for example, with the spots, they'll get a number of them and try to take this to a certain area of it and match it up. And they'll, they'll use that for like a specialty jacket. Some of them are like a vest. They really make some beautiful garments out of them. It's more spotted, white bellies, that's what they're looking for. And of course, these are the mink, mink belts. Mink are, uh, you know, they're stable of the fur trade for many years. Many, many wild mink are taken. Real fine, dark fur in here. You know, all, most of these right now, the fur prices are so low that a lot of trappers are doing what I'm going to do with some of these. Is that's just send them in and have them tanned. Get a few of these tanned up so I can keep them for either part of our, our trappers group. We like to have a fur kit that we use when we go to shows. This guy here is kind of unique. <laughs> I kind of kept him separate because this is a raccoon that what we call a blonde coon. And notice he's got almost that reddish tint to their fur, kind of unique. Sometimes you get them that they're almost white. They almost look like an albino, but it's just the color phase they have. And we call them blondes. There's a bunch of muskrats. You can see how we put them up the same way. They're all put on a frame so they have the uniform shape. And the bigger ones, of course, they'll be longer. The muskrat fur is nice, dense fur. Again, used a lot for trimming. At one time, you'd see shorty jackets made out of all solid muskrat fur. But nowadays, they're dyeing them, they're shearing them, and they're making them look like all different kind of furs, but they have a lot of use. And there's so many of them on the market that they can use a lot of it for different purposes. This little guy's a little different here. If you look at him, this is a gray fox. You notice how they're a little different in the red. They got the gray back, a little short ears, a little stubby nose, the gray silver back on them. But then you look at the belly, they have the more of the reddish tint. We have a few of those around. You can see the difference between that and the red. The red fox has got a nice red color to it. And the gray is a little bit more of a shorter fur, not as fluffy. Gray fox are uh, a little unique animal that we have because even though they inhabit much of the same area as the reds, they, uh, they can climb a tree. A lot of people see them climbing up apple trees and eating apples in the fall. 
So they're kind of, kind of unique little animal. The old stable of the fur trade as we know it here in the UP is the beaver fur. And this particular guy here is a big one. This one was taken here probably a year or so ago. And, uh, once they're taken up and skinned, you know, we put them on a board, stretch them out around, scrape all the fat off. You notice he's dry and clean here. Can't have any fat on him. And then uh, once they're ready to go, we pack them up, get them to the auction. And they're graded by size. Beaver is measured from this way and this way and added together. And uh, the maximum or the, the blanket size we call a blanket beaver is, would be a 65 inch or more. And then every 5 inch increment down goes to an extra large or, or large and down to medium. This guy here happens to measure almost 70 inches. So he's real close to what we call a super blanket. So this is a big, big old beaver here. The neat thing about the beaver is that they'll just keep getting bigger as they get older. They keep growing. They're one of the few animals that don't reach a maximum size. They're going to grow and grow. First thing they'll do with these beaver furs is they'll shear them. Almost all of them are sheared. See, the beaver has a, a long, what they call a guard here on the outside. And you can see that long guard here that's exposed right here. But then underneath there, they have that short, dense fur in here. And uh, they like to use that soft under fur for most of the garment use. So they'll shear them down, and that uses a lot in uh, in trimming. All different garments are trimmed with beaver fur. Originally, the reason that everybody trapped beaver fur across North America back in the 1600s, they used to take all the hair off them and grind it up and make a felt out of it. They packed that felt and they made felt hats. So that's what really got the fur trade going over here in this country. Everybody wanted the beaver fur because it made such a wonderful felt that it was just a top quality top quality hat. So that's where most of the beaver went back in the 16, 1700s across the, across the water. Whereas now there's so many more uses for it. You don't see too many people wearing top hats anymore. Well, that's it for tonight. If you'd like to keep tabs on what's coming up on Discovering or see where we've been, go to 906outdoors.com. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week right here on Discovering. Discovering.